I'm grateful you're watching and listening to this message. I hope that through what you hear, you really grow to understand what God says and how much he has shown his love for you in Jesus. As God's word is open, I pray that he speaks to you. And listen, if it would be helpful for you to talk to someone, please reach out. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Again, thank you for watching. A day that I am pretty sure I will remember for a long, long time happened several years ago, but uh, it's actually a day I spent in London. So what was happening as I was on in, in route to Africa, but I had a long, long layover in London. We were flying in like early in the morning, weren't flying out. Uh, so we had that connection, a long connection there in London. And like, I don't know that I'll be back in London again. I wanted to see the sights. And so kind of found, got online and saw where there was a tour bus. And it's one of those tour buses, you've seen them probably in big cities where the top is cut off so you can kind of ride around and you can see all these different sights. Amazing way to see London in, if you only have like six, seven hours. No place could we spend a lot of time but lots of places we could spend a little time and get your eyes on things that you've seen pictures of and movies of. And so, you know, uh, Trafalgar Square and you got Big Ben and you got Westminster Abbey and Buckingham Palace and all these different places that were amazing to take in. None of those stops could I spend a long, long time, but like the cumulative effect was a pretty amazing day. Again, that I don't think I'll forget. If I could be a little bit of a bus driver today, I want to take us on a tour and it actually will be a tour where we're moving pretty quickly through lots of places in Scripture. We heard, we just sang, you have the words of life, Lord. So we want those words to plant deep in us. And we've been on this mission in December to look at joy. And we'll do that through each Sunday in December. Last week, we looked particularly at, if you weren't here, uh, we looked at the fact that God is a God filled with joy. So again, I'm not sure many of us, most of us would fill in the blank like God is happy. I don't know that that'd be first in our mind or God is filled with joy if that would be first in our mind. But we talked about that last week. And this week, I want to build on that. I want to build on that idea of God is so filled with joy that he actually overflows with joy. That actually his joy spills out and it spills out in our direction. And I want us to take, okay, a little bus tour here and make a bunch of joy stops in Scripture because I want you to see the life that God wants you to have is a life filled with joy, His joy overflowing in you. So I want you to see it. Don't take my word for it. Look at Scripture. First Timothy 6 is where we'll stop first. So if I can kind of pull us into that stop, First Timothy 6 and verse 17 says this, Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant, not to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but to set their hope on God, who richly gives us all things, richly provides us with all things to enjoy. We're going to look at several scriptures. I said this last week. Feel free to take me up on it again. If you want each one of these scriptures, there's going to be a lot coming. A lot will be on the screen. Not all will be. I, I'm happy to share those with you. Uh, feel free to email me. and I'm glad to get those to you. What does Psalm 104, 28 say? It says this, when you open your hand, people are satisfied with good things. Psalm 145, verse 9, the Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all that he has made. James 1.17, so that reference is on the inside of my wedding ring. It says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. That First Timothy one, though, stands out to me because it says God richly provides how many things? All things. And why does he provide us all things? He provides us all things to enjoy. So let's make sure as we're like taking in that scripture, as we kind of pull into that stop, we recognize that God gives us a world to enjoy. It's his idea. He's the giver of all good gifts. God's designed not only, you know, all, all sorts of things. He's actually designed a full life for his people, a good life. God's designed good things. So if you go to Deuteronomy, it's a place where we've been talking about Exodus in previous weeks and Exodus kind of flows into Deuteronomy when God's people are getting ready to live in the promised land, live in a new place. I want you to read what he says. It's a life, a, a new life of worship, a new place of worship. 
He says, you will eat in the promised land. You will eat there, Deuteronomy 12, 7, in the presence of the Lord your God. And you will rejoice with your household in everything you do because the, the Lord your God has blessed you. There's this picture of joy that would come once they were in the promised land, a joy that would be even attached to things like eating together or whatever they would be doing. God wanted them to have a life, not just grinding it out, making it through, but a life filled with joy. You see kind of in Deuteronomy 26, there are these rhythms of harvest. And like, what were the people of Israel supposed to do for celebrating like a harvest or a a holiday? This is what it says in Leviticus, or uh, in Deuteronomy 26, it says, you recite the story of how God brought you out of Egypt. And then you, the Levites, the resident aliens among you, will rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given you and your household. God is a God of joy. That joy overflows and he gives us things to enjoy. He expects us, he wants us to enjoy the life that he's given to us. Even in other places in scripture, I think of how often, I think of how often children coming into our lives is meant to be, bring joy. I think of Hannah and when she had Samuel and she prayed in 1 Samuel 2, 1, my heart rejoices in the Lord. Or we heard about John the Baptist, uh, a promise of him being born. And it says this in Luke 1, 14, there will be joy and delight for you and many will rejoice at his birth when John the Baptist comes. I mean, there's, there's something attached to uh, children being born that often it brings great, great joy. And even as children grow up and there's a relationship, a parent-child relationship, it says this in Proverbs 23, 24, the father of a righteous son will rejoice greatly and one who fathers a wise son will delight in him. Let your father and mother have joy and let her who gave birth to you rejoice. We stop again and we recognize God's given us all things to enjoy. This is God's idea. And he's given us children. And one of the reasons that he gives us kids, brings those into our world, into our life, into our family, is that we would have joy. We talked about this a moment ago. We actually sang about it. But in Psalm, it talks about God's word being the source of our joy. So listen to this in Psalm 19, 8. It says the precepts of the Lord are right. So when, when God maps out, here's how you should live, it makes the heart, what does it say? It makes the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant. It makes the eyes light up. So there's this idea that when we take in God's word, as many of you did this past week, maybe in quiet times and a personal devotion, You read in God's word, the goal of God's word is to make us glad, make us joyful. Psalm 119, we sang it a moment ago. How sweet your word is to my taste. It's sweeter than honey in my mouth. So there's all these sorts of things. Like we keep, you know, pull into this stop and there's joy meant to be in God's word. We pull into this stop and there's joy that comes in kids. And we also find joy in something else. And that is, if I could put it this way, in the menu of things we would never ask for and we don't really want. I wanted to just at least uh, post some verses there, not for you necessarily right now to look every single one of those up, but there's references in Matthew and in Acts and in 2 Corinthians and Philippians and Colossians and 1 Thessalonians. I mean, there's one after another. You know what all of those verses talk about? They talk about joy but they add joy with persecution, what Peter would call fiery ordeals, suffering, slander, material poverty, difficulties, insults, weakness, feeling like you're just getting poured out as an offering, grief, loss. I mean, we might not make that connection But I want to just see the sheer volume. And this is just a little bit of a sampler platter of how many times God goes here with all of those things that on that menu, I don't want any of that menu. And yet God says those things, joy isn't absent. Joy can be present with that. We actually can find joy in the middle of our world blowing up. How is that possible? Well, Psalm 31 says it this way, I will rejoice and be glad in your faithful love because you have seen my affliction. 
So your life begins to unravel and what you once had such strong control of, you don't have. And, or maybe you experience insults or slander. Or maybe you are experiencing right now weakness. But God sees it. And that's a cause for rejoicing. Or I think of Psalm 94, 19, when I'm filled with cares. What you don't read is, when I'm filled with cares, I get written off. When I'm filled with cares, your comfort brings me joy. So even in the suffering, even in the pain, even in the slander, even in the grief, even in the loss, there is something that God is writing this story, a writing a story of joy. And all the things that I mentioned, whether it be that weakness and fiery ordeals and suffering and all sorts of difficulties, all those things are temporary. And there's a permanent joy coming. I love how Jeremiah talked about it. In Jeremiah 31, it says, they will come and shout for joy for the heights of Zion. They will be radiant with joy because of the Lord's goodness. So again, you pull into that station, which none of us necessarily want to be pulled into the station where it's like life falling apart. But even in that stop, there's all these references to joy. There's references to joy. Can we pull into another stop? And that is when God's people get together. So Psalm 122 verse 1 says this, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Coming together in worship. Let's, let's come to the house of the Lord. Coming together. Let, not just let me, but let us. When there's a, a coming together of God's people. Or I think even in Nehemiah. So Nehemiah 12. It, by that point in time, there's this finished task. They actually had a wall that was broken down. And now it's been rebuilt. And Nehemiah 12 lists all these people. So you read the chapter and it's name after name after name. They're all, they're all pretty much hard to pronounce. They're all ancient Hebrew names. And then you come to the place where they all gathered together. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices and they rejoiced because, because why? Because God had given them great joy. And the women and children also celebrated and Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. Again, the life that God has for us is one where joy is not a stranger, but where joy is present. I love how joy is also connected with people. So, well, the way 3 John says it, 3 John 4, John writing says, I have no greater joy than this, that my children are walking in truth. I don't even think that's necessarily biological children. Certainly could include that. But it's the people that, oh, that John had bored his life into. I have no greater joy than they are walking in truth. Or, or I read uh, Paul's words to Philemon in Philemon 7, for I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. There's a joy that Paul has because he's watched what is going on with Philemon. It's the joy you feel when you, you, you think someone is like, they get it, they are walking and they have such a good influence on other people. It's not just individuals, but a whole church at Philippi. So when you read the book of Philippians, a word keeps coming up again and again, joy, joy, rejoice. It's actually called the letter of the epistle of joy. It starts off with Paul saying, I pray with you. I pray with joy for you. But then Philippians 4, 1, so then my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, you're my joy. So Paul's in prison when he writes Philippians. He thinks about a church in Philippi in ancient Greece. And he says, they like anybody brings me joy, they bring me joy. Not just one individual, but collectively as a church, he thinks of the people in Philippi. He thinks the same in the church at Colossae, Colossians 2, 5, for I may be absent in body, again, writing from prison, but I'm with you in my spirit and I'm rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. I stop again and again and again and again. This is just a sample of how many times, I think you'd be surprised at how many times joy comes up. Joy is connected to the Lord, which is why Philippians 4.4, 4, which maybe you've memorized this, rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, rejoice. Or maybe this benediction, this prayer, this beautiful prayer in Romans 15 now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. This is what God desires to do, wants to do. Fill us with all joy and peace as we believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy. Or this time of year, we think of 
Mary and her song. And these weren't, like, these weren't cheap words that she's saying. Her life would get blown up as a result of God working through her. And yet she found such great joy. She says this in Luke 1, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. There's constant joy. What does it sound like? You see the list of references. Can I just go through them quickly? Psalm 4, 7. You being God, you put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and new wine abound. Psalm 9.2, I will rejoice and I will boast about you. I will sing about your name most high. Psalm 9.14, I will rejoice in your salvation within the gates of daughter Zion. Psalm 13.5, I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. Psalm 16.11, you reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant of joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Psalm 37, 4, take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Psalm 149, 2, let Israel celebrate its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. I mean, how many different ways do we have to hear it for us to appreciate one of the things God wants for us, every single person that would be a follower of Jesus Christ is that you would be filled with joy, that you would be filled with joy. One more stop I'd like to make I, kind of on this joy circuit is Isaiah 25, 9. Not written at the best of times in Israel. And I would love for us to maybe stay here for just a second and I'd love for you to take in this verse. Because at the time it's written, Israel is not experiencing lots of earthly reasons for them to be filled with joy. They're absorbing all sorts of loss and all sorts of pain, most of it deserved They're experiencing the judgment of God. But then right in the middle of this book, it's on that day, there's a hope, there's a a promise. Like on that day, it will be said, look, look, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has saved us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. So let's rejoice because God has saved us. There are coming a day where our faith becomes sight and we see the Lord and we say, this is what I've been waiting for. Let's rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And if Isaiah could say that, and Isaiah is written pre-cross of Jesus Christ, pre-birth of Jesus, pre-resurrection of Jesus. If Isaiah could say, there's, there's coming a day where we will, we will rejoice and say, this is our God, he's come. He has come. And how much more today when we actually have a, a lot more of the full picture We do recognize that God is such a good God and he's king of everything and he made a perfect world and rather than submit to his rule, we rebel against it. We kind of shake our fist instead of welcoming his rule in our life. We rebel and that earns punishment. We would deserve to die and yet God seeing us in our sin took our place. Jesus on the cross and he saved us, he rescued us, freed us from the power of sin, pardoned us, And when you rely on him, you experience the salvation of God. This is is what we've been waiting for. There's joy in salvation. We'll talk about this more next week, but this is the epicenter of joy. God, we've, we've, we've waited and you delivered. You kept your promises. So there's just this theme. And again, I've only touched on it. If you do a basic Bible search, other word joy or rejoice or enjoyment or delight or pleasure, you're gonna see it come up again and again. So everything that I've described is actually the life I want to have. Everything that I've described about joy is the life you were meant to have. Everything that I've talked about with joy is a taste of eternal life that you will have if you're trusting in Jesus. And you need to know this. Scripture takes joy extremely seriously. It's not a cheap concept. God takes his joy that he overflows with. He takes that very seriously and he wants you to have that. And because that joy is such a precious commodity coming from God to us, I do want to ask you, do you protect your joy? Joy demands some serious protection. Do you guard it? Is your joy diminishing or is it growing? Do you know how your joy gets maximized? Because a million things will chip away at it. I can't imagine one person in this room who would say, I'd be content with less joy. I'd actually, more miserable life would be better for me. I mean, 
maybe if we're not quite processing life the way we should, but most everybody wants more joy. So how serious are you about protecting it? How well do you know the things that would like hack into your joy and take it from you? How well do you guard it? How well could we expose, like shine a light on the things that would take our joy and make it less or cause us to lose it altogether? I think those questions are so important for us to ask. Do you know what would hack your joy? What would take it? I want to offer a few things, just searching my own heart, searching scripture. I want you to see some things that if you go down this path, you could actually end up with less joy, diminished joy. And I think your joy is so worth guarding and protecting. I think like, let's call it out. So there's one category that I would say like the, the out of bounds category. So one way your joy could be diminished is when you think and you live as if enjoying God's gifts is out of bounds. What am I talking about? I, I think by osmosis, no one ever preaches or says it this way, but I think by osmosis, we take in that there are kind of two kinds of joy. There's like joy related to church and maybe Christian music and like reading your Bible. And then there's all kinds of other joys and all these other joys. Yeah, we pro probably shouldn't enjoy those things too much. And we begin to kind of think some joy is completely out of bounds. Maybe you begin to absorb, again, no one would teach this, but maybe you begin to absorb, God probably doesn't want me to enjoy a lot of things in life. Maybe in heaven we'll enjoy lots of things. But here we just grind it out, slug it out. But if God, so hear this, if God gives joy as a gift, does it honor him as a giver to say, nope, I'm not going to receive it because I might be too joyful. I'd rather not receive these things. I'd rather be more miserable because I think that honors. I mean, does that really, if you give a gift, do you want someone to receive it and enjoy it? You do. Part of your enjoyment is that person receiving joy out of it. So maybe this is the time where we begin to intentionally and consistently enjoy God's gifts to us. What kinds of gifts? I was thinking about this all week long. I was thinking about just the small, like we say they're small, but if they're from God, they're meant for us to enjoy. So I don't know what your list would look like, but I jotted a few things down that may possibly make your list. Could it be that something like Christmas tree lights, does God want you to enjoy those? How about a good cup of coffee? Does God want you to enjoy that? How about tasteful Christmas decorations? How about the tacky Christmas decorations? Does God want you to enjoy those? How about a long walk in the woods? How about memories of the best Christmas you ever had? How about memories of the one that wasn't the best, but kind of made you smile, made everybody laugh, and it was what it was? And remembering it brings you to a certain place. How, how about a beautiful piece of music? Does God want you to enjoy that? How about a silly piece of music? Does God want you, does he want your kids to laugh at that? Are, are we meant to enjoy good things? What about wreaths and bows? What about inside jokes that you have with your family and friends? What about the Bible verse that came at just the right time? What about a good workout or a board game? Does God want you to enjoy good things? What about Christmas cookies or that gingerbread house that looked a certain way on the box, but you couldn't quite get yours to look that way? Does God want you to enjoy that? Does God want you to enjoy giving to a cause or a need that's much bigger than yourself? Does God want you to enjoy a good meal with even better conversation? Has God designed you to enjoy pictures of loved ones who aren't here but made your life so much better when they were? Are you meant to enjoy that? Are you meant to enjoy when your friend got the job that you had been praying she would get and she got it? Are you meant to enjoy those things? For some Scrooges out there, you can enjoy that December will end and you'll get back to normal in January. And that, that may just bring you the height of joy as all of it's done and I get to enjoy life back to normal. How about the candy cane lights on the aquarium? Are we meant to enjoy the present that you just know someone will love? Or a funny picture from a Christmas in the past? Or a Christmas card from a friend or someone you care about? I mean, all these things, and I could go on and on and on. I don't know what would make your list. But I'm positive God gives us all these things to enjoy. 
Should people who don't know Jesus enjoy the world more than those who do? Are we somehow honoring God by saying, I won't enjoy anything? I mean, really, this is, I, I understand the place for self-denial. I, I think that's a sermon for another day. I understand the place for fasting, and that's another sermon for another day. But even that, even when we deny ourselves, we're denying ourselves, certainly denying ourselves of sin, but when we deny ourselves even of good things, we still recognize they're good. When we fast, we still recognize that food is good. Could a, you go throughout the day, could you be more intentional about your days and your morning? What if by lunchtime you had seriously enjoyed a dozen things and you had just noticed, like, I enjoy that, I enjoy that, I enjoy that. What if you began to keep a joy journal? Just God's good gifts to you that you are more inclined to notice. I think that may even be an opportunity to share your faith. Some of you may think you're terrible at it, but you could be really good at noticing how God gives you so many things to enjoy, and you could talk about it. We're thinking about how to protect our joy. So I don't want to rule things out of bounds to somehow think I'm honoring God by being miserable. There's another category of things, and that would be maybe in the, could I call it like the overlooking category, and that is when we miss out on gratitude and worship by overlooking the ultimate giver. I think you'll experience more joy. I think your joy will be maximized instead of diminished when you actually appreciate the giver. Like the way some Christian writers, as they talk about, there's a sunbeam, and so you follow that sunbeam all the way back to the sun. So here's the gift and you recognize there's a good giver of that gift. One of the reasons we're given so many things, I think, is that we are meant to enjoy and worship the Lord. What kind of God do we have? Do you really just want to chalk it up to luck? Or the odds being ever in your favor? Like, is that, is that what we want to chalk it up to? Or do we want to take this thing and this thing and this thing, all these things that we, we enjoy before lunch, and we say, Man, there is a good God who gives us good things. What if you got to enjoy God more throughout the day? I think that would change who you are. Maybe you wonder about how you could be, how you could be filled with gratitude. and How could you worship all day long? This would be one way. Whether you eat or drink, whether, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, giving him thanks for all that he has given you. God isn't disconnected from real things. God doesn't just operate in the spiritual things, whatever those things are for you. But God is present, giving us all sorts of good things. So there's that overlooking joy when you miss out on gratitude and worship because you don't even like take time to point your heart toward the giver, the ultimate giver. We're trying to be on guard. We don't want our joy diminished. One way we can diminish our joys is kind of the out of order category. When you actually mess up the order of what brings you the greatest joy. What, what really is at the core of your joy? To protect our joy, we have to look at the sources and make sure, do we have the things in the right priorities? It means you probably take inventory. I remember working retail. It was a while back, but I would work retail, and inventory was never my favorite time. You had to put the little stickers on all those things and make sure, you know, the count was right. You know, one reason, another reason why people take inventory, sometimes you see them walking around a department store or a grocery store, and they scan to see, is that price reading correctly? Because you want to make sure the price is are accurate. And I wonder if we scanned our joys, are, are, are they in the right priority? Or have they kind of morphed over time and gotten out of order? So two things can be true at the same time. One could be God gave us something to really enjoy. It's from his hand. And it also could be true that it's gotten way out of hand. It means way, way too much to me. And some things that actually should be over it are, are now like getting diminished because of that. And we never should have let that take place. Lesser things coming at the expense of people that matter to us. Often when we get this out of order. So again, hear me say, I think God gives us tons of things to enjoy, but some things we actually begin to, maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's something faster, flashier, brighter, we're told by the marketing people it's better. And maybe that isn't just something we could enjoy, but now we're, it, it's, it's way out of order. What happens is our joy begins to collapse under that weight. It disappoints us. The things that bring the most joy. 
I do, I do wonder if we need to do some, take some tests, the love God, love neighbor tests, the things that bring us the greatest joy. Is God a part of those? The things that bring us the greatest joy, is 90% of the joy is just things related to myself that don't involve a neighbor, don't involve one other person. They're just all about me. Maybe some things are out of order, out of priority. What about things that last into the new creation? Would those things, like I would think those things would ramp up. So again, it's not saying we can't enjoy things. Just maybe worth going, like man, that hobby or my job or whatever does bring me joy. Is it, is it maybe at the place where it's superseding some things that maybe it shouldn't have? It's worth asking whether we're intentional enough. It's probably worth even inviting a friend if you've got questions. Like God gives us other brothers and sisters in Christ who may be able to navigate it. One more thing that I think could diminish your joy, and it may be that the most important you hear is actually in the category of an overload. Could it be when multiplying distractions and diversions begin to overload you? So, I mean, man, the Lord has given us so much stuff. There's so many things literally at our fingertips right now. And maybe because there's so many things coming at you, you almost become numb to it. There's a world out there with a bazillion things to enjoy. How many YouTube videos would you, could you possibly enjoy? Like how many songs on Spotify or Apple Music could you possibly enjoy? I mean, hundreds of thousands. I do wonder. I, actually, I don't wonder. I think I realize more and more we're being controlled not so much by like trying to find joy, but just getting things overloaded. So we scroll and we scroll and we scroll. And there's a cat video and it's kind of funny. And then there's the thing we're shopping for and that kind of brings me joy. And then there's this and that picture from that. Per- and then there's this. And then I keep up with this. And then there's that song I want to And then there's this. And it just begins to overload the circuits. So much noise, so much stuff, so much consumption, so many small things that the bigger things get crowded out. There's just not room for them. The sheer volume means you're dull and distracted. The things that could bring you joy just don't seem to do it anymore. It's almost like you're given $1,000, and you, know, you could do some damage with $1,000, but instead you just spend it at the junk store, and you just have a car full of junk, and you have nothing to, for the things that would really, really matter, the things that you would most deeply desire. Or it's like you just like eat a bag of 100 Tootsie Rolls right before dinner. And the dinner you really wanted to eat, like your favorite dinner, you don't get to enjoy it because you're sick, because you ate 100 stupid Tootsie Rolls. I just have to begin to wonder. All the big tech, all of them that want our attention, and they want it again and again, and they'll gladly buzz and notify us again and again and again. And frankly, it'll be something that you could enjoy something that may be worth your attention, but I just wonder if the sheer volume of those deposits, it may be that you have to simplify. And by the way, I don't think this is like, man, kids these days, it's not one of those conversations. It's like all of us these days have had our attention hacked. And it's one thing with our attention, but I'm actually talking about your joy. Have you been given so many things? Like, so maybe instead of a thousand things before lunchtime, you enjoy about a dozen but you really take inventory of those and they direct your heart. And instead of scrolling for an hour and you wonder like, what was that? Do I really need updates on scores that really mean nothing? to Like how how many more times do I need to see who's mad at who or what the problem is? Like how much more of this do I need? I wonder if I began to diminish that, even though sure, it could bring you joy. I wonder if I begin to not stress so much about all the million things that I missed today that possibly happened on the internet. I wonder if I was not so consumed with that. I do wonder if my joy receptors would be a little bit more sensitive toward the things that really, really matter. And we'll think about in five years from now. Again, I'm not anti-tech. I have a smartphone. I have way more devices than I need. But I'm beginning asking questions like, am I using them or are they using me? And is my joy diminished because of dumb stuff that I have nothing to show for. 
we took a, a really quick joy tour. Then we looked at like these things that would hack our joy. This is one of those where I'm not sure it like sets up for like, what are we going to do in the next two minutes? It's probably like, what are we going to do in the next week to begin to take inventory? But I did want for God's word to have the last word. So I'd like for us to come full circle to 1 Timothy 6, 17. And I actually want us to read it together and that'll close our time. I'll pray and then we'll sing. We'll sing a song I enjoy. We'll sing Silent Night. And uh, one of the songs I enjoy doing at Christmas. Let's read it together, all right, church? Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Let me pray. Father, what can we say but thank you for providing us richly with all things to enjoy? So I pray this would be a church that really knows how to enjoy things. And then help us discern where those joys get out of order and give us the uh, discipline to correct that. Lord, where we are overloaded as, not just as a society, but as a church where we have become overloaded, where we've let so many things hack into our joy. I pray this would be a week where we experience the deepest joys and we trace them all the way back to the giver. And I pray we would love you more and we would recognize your joy more for having spent some time opening your word. Speak to us, Lord. Show us what needs to be changed. And then help us, because we'll have a lot of good intentions here. And those good intentions may not even make it past lunch. So I pray that you would help us to put things in place that would maximize our joy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.